Business ownership has never been hotter, but how do you do it? That's where I come in. Allow me to guide you on your journey. Welcome to Ion Franchise. This episode sponsored by SEO Samba. Empower your franchise with predictable results and AI-driven marketing. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another fabulous episode of Ion Franchising. And I'm your host, Lance Gralick. We talk often about unsexy, boring businesses, a lot of businesses that people really never thought that they would get involved with. But here is another hot one. Everybody is talking about HVAC, air conditioning, heating, et cetera. And imagine doing $10 million a year in your own air conditioning franchise. Well, Mark Collins, president and CEO of 1-800-PLUMBER and AIR, is going to tell you all about it. So welcome to the show, Mark. Yeah, thanks for having me, Lance. Uh, uh, looking forward to being on with you today. Well, thank you very much for being here. Uh, so let's start with the obvious. How the heck did Mark get in the world of franchising and 1-800-PLUMBER and AIR? Yeah, so I've got a I've got an interesting journey, I guess. Uh, uh, I've been I was born into not into the franchising world, but I was born into the plumbing uh, the plumbing space. Uh, so my my family journey goes back all the way to 1905. So I'm a fifth generation plumber uh, here in the Houston area, uh, with my great great grandfather starting a plumbing business uh, uh, back in 1905 here in Houston, and every every generation since has been in the space, and so uh, happy to carry on the the, the tradition uh, in the in the plumbing space, but that didn't take us to the path of franchising. And so your specific, you know, question was maybe more to how did we get to this franchising space? Yes. Uh, and so, uh, was able to get, uh, what I believe is the best name and brand in the industry, at least the easily recognizable, uh, with one hundred plumber, uh, was able to acquire that in 2015. And then from there, we started asking the question, well, how do we grow and how do we scale? Uh, and, and, and so had some different paths to do that. We could have done it on our own. We could have done it as a, a singular owned national brand. Uh, but it didn't quite align with what some things that got me excited. Uh, and so kind of with why franchising. And so, uh, I enjoy helping people. I enjoy helping other people win, I help other people uh, realize their dreams and successes and franchising really gives us the opportunity to do that. And so finding, you know, strong owners and great markets with a solid brand, uh, really helping people build something special is what gets me excited about what we do every day. Awesome. So the plumbing component and the air component together, when did they join or make meet? <laughs> sure. Yep. So that actually rolled out for us in 2019 uh, is when we we piloted it uh, for a few years before that. Um, and just to just make sure that the model was solid. Um, but, uh, you know, really giving us some unique um, differentiators in the market. Uh, and and often franchising can be a game uh, played by how many dots can I get on the map? Uh, if you're in the franchising world and rubbing shoulders with folks, it's how many you know, how many units do you got or how many territories or, or, or yeah. some sort of metric. And that's a healthy metric. I'm not, I'm not knocking the metric there because it's a non-invasive question trying to understand like what size are you yeah. in the home service space? We often ask how many trucks you got, right? It's a similar question. Yeah. Um, but when, when I started thinking about like, well, what, what, what am I really trying to do here? Uh, it, it's, it's the dots on the map are important because it represents locations and market share and things along those lines, but really wanting to build something of size or giving our franchise owners the opportunity to build something of size. And so not always having to go wider with market penetration, but really allowing us to go deeper. So establishing a strong relationship with our customers on the plumbing side, and then uh, that leading into opportunities on the HVAC side, you know, AC replacements, furnaces, et cetera, uh, where we can go deeper with that customer relationship by adding additional revenue streams and things like that. So that's, I guess, in the, the the method behind the madness with it, but uh, really rolled that out in 2019. It sounds logical to me. The question I have, though, is how does that work? Because normally if I see an air conditioning company in a vehicle, there's an air conditioning tech person in that vehicle. If I see a plumbing truck, there's a plumber in that truck. If I see one that says 1-800-PLUMBER and AIR, are there two people in the truck or is there one person that knows both? How does that work? Yeah, great question. 
Yeah, well, there are a few I would I refer to in them as uh, as unicorns out there, and these are guys that are skilled or and licensed or certified in both both trades. Wow, but that's a rarity. So yeah. uh, they do exist, but those are those are harder to come by. So we do have plumbing uh, 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 vans uh, within locations that are specifically focused on plumbing, and those are licensed plumbers. And then we have our HVAC techs and their own vans, and then they're running those calls. So we are driving demand uh keeping both of those guys busy year round but it's usually uh specific uh van specific to the service yeah understood so when it comes to who are you looking for uh and before we get to that actually how many current franchisees do you have and how many corporate locations do you have roughly yeah so uh we're uh, quickly approaching 40 uh franchise owners or or franchise locations uh pushing closer to 70 units among those owners if you want to use that metric as we have m- multiple uh yeah. multi unit franchise owners and, and by the um, way mark it's it's one of my favorite metrics when franchise owners are willing to be do, become multi unit owners it's obviously a good sign they get they want as many territories as they can get their hands on yeah, and scale and, and right and that yeah, for sure. Uh, we've got a two two locations that we're running corporately um, uh, uh, as as part of it. So uh, I think you asked a few other questions there, but I guess I'll, yeah. I'll pause with that one. No, 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 that's perfect. So now, when it comes to who you're looking for, that was the question. What is the individual, the audience that's listening, that's leaning in? It's a lot of people that don't know anything about plumbing or air conditioning that know franchising is built for people that don't have to be a technician. So how does that work? And are some of your most successful franchisees at this point, non-plumbers and non-HVAC experts? Yeah, so it's a great question. So the assumption is, is I I need to be a plumber or or be a fifth generation plumber or some sort of background like that to get into our, our franchise model. And in fact, we're, we are looking for and pursuing the exact opposite. Like over 85% of our franchise owners are coming in with zero or very little experience in the space. Uh, uh, and and and, we're, and we, with our processes and our training and all of that can help them scale and grow quickly as part of it. Uh, but what I've found, so coming from a family of trades, tradesmen and plumbers specifically, uh, and being in the industry for a long time, um, n- just because you're a good technician, at what you do doesn't necessarily translate that you would be a good business owner. Yeah, now, that's a very general statement. So there's always exceptions to that. So, and I'm not, and I know good trades people that have turned into good business owners. Uh, but by and large, um, the, when you get a, a technician that's trying to then transition in from the op, from the field into the office, um, they often want to solve problems by going right back out into the field. Yeah. And so we're, we're looking for owners that want to run their business, you know, and yeah. invest in people, invest in marketing, invest in uh, the different things that they need to scale. And so that's why we're looking for who we're looking for. I'm laughing because you said scale multiple times already and you just said it again. And it's one of the biggest questions that people ask on a regular basis or tell me myself as a franchise broker consultant, Lance, I want something that I can scale. And when you are a technician or you were a technician, you have that propensity, that that draw, if you will, like you just said, to go out in the field, solve problems. And that's the worst thing you can do. You you just you can never figure out how to scale if you're having to solve all of those little problems. You need people to solve the problems, right? Yep. That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And the tendency is the fire break, you know, there's a fire that go or an even a good opportunity. Oh, a big job. Let me go out and address that big job. And you have a win for the day, but you're not really building anything long term. Yeah. Uh, and then you, you hit this ceiling of capacity of what yeah. you're able to actually do if you're the one always out there trying to trying to spin the wheel. Yeah. So let's talk about scale a little further. Dig a little deeper into that. You obviously your typical franchisee talk about the investment. You start with a van, right? Start with one, probably. Talk about how that goes in the investment. Sure. Yeah, we're going to start with two vans. Uh, so, and we're going to focus on our, on our, uh, being that we have two services, uh, the assumption would be that we would start on one plumbing van and one HVAC van, but we actually don't start that way. We actually start with plumbing first. It's the foundation of our model. It's the foundation of our business. Uh, plumbing is busy 12 months out of the year. 
HVAC has some seasonality to it. So uh, in different parts of the country, that seasonality varies, but there's a spring and a fall in most markets, and those are typically slower times of the year for HVAC, but that's not true for, for plumbing. And so we we build our foundation and in our, in our uh, revenue on the plumbing model, and then we scale into the, uh, or grow into the HVAC space uh, within three, ideally within three to six months of opening. Um, uh, so from a, from a revenue, from a cost standpoint, um, you know, you're in the $150,000 range, um, startup cost, uh, and we can give you specifics. Obviously they're in our FDD, um, yeah. and you can dive into the spe uh, specifics of that, but, and with, you're going to get two vans, uh, the, um, the equipment that's needed, the tools that are needed, the material that's needed, et cetera. Um, uh, all the marketing plans, all the stuff that you need to get rolling with that. Um, and the part of the reason that we like to one, we know that with our marketing strategy, we can get the call volume necessary to get those guys uh, busy quickly. Uh, so we don't, we, that's not an, a huge concern for us, but it also maintains stability for the franchise owner. If you got one guy and he calls in sick and you as the franchise owner don't have the skill set, the, the licensing, et cetera, your business yeah. kind of gets shut down temporarily, which is what yeah. we don't want. And so, so having uh, two guys uh, or two two uh, technicians builds that initial stability uh, and really helps helps the location uh, grow. Uh, Got it. Months. So normally I don't talk about marketing this quickly, but you piqued my interest. So marketing becomes even more important because now you have two vans, two guys or gals. You have to keep busy. So talk a little bit about the marketing and the launch. So a new franchisee comes on board. Uh, we can talk about training in a little bit as well. But how does the marketing work to keep these guys or gals busy? Yeah, so, you know, we're, we, um, each market's a little different, but, you know, and we'll take a customizable approach to that. But the overall recipe is the same. Uh, but we we dive into uh, there's things that that we're doing on our end to to help penetrate that market. Some of that, uh, most of that being digital um, with intentional SEO strategy. Um, the way that we build our website, you know, we're not just building landing pages for locations, but we're you know it's a 30 plus page website to help drive uh, organic rankings, things along those lines. But playing in the whole Google world, and I could dive into that more if, if we'd like. But yeah. but winning in that space, and then also just there's some industry specific uh, uh, marketing platforms that that we know work well, uh, and then and then making sure that we we execute on those um, to drive calls. Right. Uh, you know, as part of that. So is it making sure, okay, we get the lead that's coming in. Then we get, then we got to make sure we book the lead, obviously. Um, and then when, when the, the technician goes on site, they need to do follow our process and making sure that they're converting on that, on that lead uh, right. at the highest, um, highest possible conversion. The way we say it in, with the way we say it on our team, highest, highest possible conversion while maintaining the utmost honesty and integrity. Uh, and so, you know, making sure that the ethics and all of that is managed well through that entire process. Love that. Love that you instill that in them. So are you tracking at the corporate level uh, if the leads are coming through methods that you're helping create? So are you tracking these metrics to understand the conversions and, and all that? Yeah, so... Uh, we track a lot of metrics, uh, uh, and and with the dashboards and things like that that we have. Uh, of course, it starts there. Um, but uh, quantity of leads, conversion of those leads, uh, return on ad spend from those leads, um, and and not uh, some channels. Uh, you know, we they're not universal. So channels right. that we find that they oftentimes can have regional conversions. And those are some certain things that, that we're paying attention to that uh, certain markets have higher ad, ad, adoption rates of certain certain platforms uh, than others. Um, right. And uh, I could. Uh, and so we, we monitor that and say, well, just because it's working great in this part of the country, it may or may not translate well into your market. Uh, we let the data drive those decisions, and so um, we may pull off pull out of certain channels in certain regions uh, right. if we're not getting the conversions. Uh, but but trying to let the data drive that, not the emotions, uh, yeah. when it comes to those decisions. No, and that, it makes sense. And and if you have something that does work well in one market, other markets might want to try whatever that new thing mm -hmm. is. Algorithms change, methods do change, billboards don't change that much, except the prices just keep going up, right? 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I think what's what's changing, though, is the consumer habit with all of these, you know, uh, you know, thinking uh, when you when we were when you were Starbucks, when we were buying coffee, it wasn't that long ago, a couple of years back, you, were, you had two choices. You're going inside or you're going through the drive through, you know, and, and the way that people are buying coffee nowadays is most of the most folks don't want to talk to anybody. They're ordering it on an app in advance. Yeah. And then they're swinging by and picking up and never conversing with the soul, which is good or bad. It's that's not the point of the conversation. It's just the way it's just the reality that we're living in. Yeah. And so understanding that that's also our consumers in the home service space and, and realizing that that's that's where we're headed. That's where we're at. And that's where we're headed. And so uh, we are consumers are shifting away from phone calls. They don't necessarily want to pick up the phone and schedule an appointment. They're just fine booking on an app or yeah. through some sort of chat functionality or those type of things. And so, you know, what we continue to work on is making sure that we can comp we can provide a similar buying experience that they're getting in other in their normal everyday lives. Yeah. Um, and so that includes with how what lead channels that they're using. And so uh, a lot of them are coming through different apps and different things like that, because that's what that's what the buyers are, are using nowadays um, in every other area of their life. So why not? Why not for their home, too? Yeah, I love that. So, you know, diving into you're talking about technology. What is the secret sauce, if you will? I know you're not a burger place, but what is that secret sauce to 1-800-PLUMBER and AIR? There is are there's a lot of options out there. And you're fortunate today in that everybody seems to be looking at the home services space because people have now found out. I mean, I was a guy that owned a lot of restaurant franchises. I didn't know anything about home services. And I felt like, you know, 10 years ago, I was late to the game learning that, man, I should have done this. It's a lower investment. It's a higher return on investment. You know, I didn't know much about cooking either at the time. And I had sure. to hire people that did. And now I'm pretty good. But that's another story. So what is the secret sauce when people are looking at all these different franchises out there? Why 1-800-PLUMBER and AIR? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, we just had training this, some in, some training this week, some folks uh, that are going to be open up soon and and even had this same conversation, right? Like what what is this this thing that makes us different? I think it's a good question to ask. So there's some obvious things, right? Our name is our numbers, our website. You know, I think we, we have a unique advantage with that, but that's only going to take us so far. Um, so, okay, cool. So it's easy to remember. That's easy to get a hold of us. Great. Uh, but beyond that, like what what is the difference? And so uh, we have we have uh, customized the in-home customer experience that focuses on every single pain point that we all have when we're dealing with trying to get people to come to our home. Uh, most people have a, have a bad story of a, or a negative experience from some type of home professional coming to the home. Maybe it's the cable guy. Maybe it's pest control. Maybe it's the plumber. Um, but most people have a story or they know someone who's had a bad story. And in some instances, those stories are, 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 you know, really sad. Like, you know, they yeah. really were taken advantage of, or they really were screwed or they, you know, severe damage was done to their home or, you know, there's some really ugly stories out there in the contractor space as a whole. Yeah. Uh, and so it's like, man, we can do better. Like our industry deserves better. Homeowners deserve a better experience. And so we are focusing on those pain points. So nobody likes waiting on the plumber. Cool. You don't have to wait on us. Uh, we'll call you before we come. We're going to send you a text message before we come. We're going to send you a link of where our driver is. And you can see, kind of like with your Uber experience, you can see exactly where the truck is and to the minute of when he's going to show up to your house. So if you're going to go, you want to go and run to the store real quick, no big deal. You can see when your guy's coming and beat him there, you know, and beat him there. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and so technology, there's, there's more examples of this, but technology is what's driving that experience, uh, that translates into the home. How do we provide a comfortable experience? Not this salesy, um, kind of slimy approach that sometimes, uh, you know, contractors get, you know, get talked into or coerced or manipulated. Yeah. Um, and so our ethics pull, you know, range strong with how we operate, uh, in that, in that experience, making sure that when we're done that the customer goes man that was the best experience i've ever had and, and if we can remember that this is a one-on-one -on -one experience you know this is their home for many the largest investment they'll ever make is their home treat it like that focus on that individual experience the brand reputation is going to take care of itself and so 
Uh, is it a secret sauce? I don't have a secret way of doing uh, fixing pipes. I don't have a secret way of of uh, adding Freon to your AC system. But I don't think that's the pain point of our yeah. market today. I think the pain point of our market today is um, we're tired of, of poor customer experience. Uh, we're over it. Uh, and I think when people can get a better, realizing that there is a better way, um, they're all in. Yeah. No, that's. I think that's a great answer. So talk about the franchisee or the franchise selection process. And then back to that training piece I wanted to cover earlier. So either I bring somebody to you that I think is a great candidate to become a franchisee. They find you organically or through other brokers. What, what does that really look like? What are you what are you looking for? You want to make sure they're financially qualified. Talk a little bit about validation. Do you have a meet the team day? Let's go through some of that. Yeah. Um, so our process, you know, I think I think there's there's two steps. I see it. I, I always compare that whole process. It's like courtship leading, hopefully leading to marriage. And, yeah. and but we'd we'd love to make sure on both sides of that of that relationship. So a candidate side or, or someone interested in our brand, as well as on our side, that both sides of that, we don't want to, we don't want to get married and then realize we don't like each other. Yeah. So if we're not a good fit, we need to figure that out early on. Um, and maybe that's not the best example, but that's kind of how I envision this. I this think it's a perfect this, example, Mark. This, this process. So <laughs> we don't want to rush into it, but we also need don't need to take forever in that. So there's yeah. some things that we're doing. So everything you said, right, we're financially validating. In our application process, one of the things that we do that's a little bit unique is the, the way that they fill out that application. They're also answering questions that, that we that ultimately helps us score them on are they a good cultural fit or are they not a good culture fit and that data that we're comparing that to is against our our successful owners or some that we have that have had some sort of interaction with our brand that we did not feel like was a good fit so we've yeah. worked with um, um psychologists and different things different professionals to help build this formula for us it's not perfect uh, yeah. But we use that as an initial like screening process to go, well, do we think we could be a good fit or do we not? And can we quantify this, not just base it off of any emotion or feeling, but is there some data that we could use to help drive that? So that's early in the process. Um, and then, of course, we go through our FDD and make sure they're comfortable there with the franchise agreement, what that's going to look like. Um, and then I'm going to I'm going to jump on a call with them. Um, uh, it, after our sales team has been 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 talking with them through that. And I, we do as we do as uh, on our executive call. Um, one of the things that's paramount for me is: Are we aligned on what success looks like? And and I don't start with financial success. Uh, what for me is: Are we aligned on uh, how we see people? Um, we may not agree on politics. We may not agree on religion. We may not agree on some of those other things. Totally cool. But we do need to agree on how we see our people which would be our employees and our customers. And so I spend some time talking about our core values uh, because if we can't align there, there's no reason really to go further. And yeah. so do we, can we, can we agree on those things uh, and, and what the culture is going to look like? And, 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 um, uh, and then from there, we got a lot to build on. Um, and then, and then are we, do we have the same scalable vision and future and things like that? But but that that is the 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 precipice of of whether or not we will move forward or not move forward is if we can't if we don't see people the same way if it's all about the money for you and there's nothing wrong with that we're just we're probably not the right brand and that's okay um, but I believe that success is the the path to the money is through people and if we but yeah. treating them the right way and that's start, that starts with our employees and then it, then they will then replicate that to our customers and so. I won't jump too far down that soapbox, but that is critical for me uh, yeah. and, and making sure that we align, we align there. I love it. So how do you do validation? Is it, is it group calls? Do you give them a list of the franchisees? They call whoever they want. How does that work? Yeah, um, we give them, uh, we don't do group validation at this time. Uh, we may implement that's in some internal conversations that we may, we may do that at some point. So right now it's just some one-on-one -on -one calls that we give them contact information to, to owners and, and let them uh, making sure that they get time to to to, to ask those questions. It cool. also allows for those conversations to be a little bit more candid and and open uh, with our with our franchise owners, yeah. um, where we're not bird dog in the conversation or anything like that. So, um, but yeah, that's a critical part of the process. Yeah. And do you do a an in person meet the team or discovery day, or is that done via Zoom? 
sponsored by Leap Brands. From executive recruiting to hourly staff, Leap is your one-stop shop for all of your franchise talent. Yeah, it depends. Kind of depends on the scenario. Uh, we will do them in person uh, or Zoom. We've done them both ways. Um, and so it just kind of depends on the scenario and the timing. Uh, yeah. But we may not, we don't always do one. Um, so I'm not saying that it's, uh, there are some situations where we do, we have not done them. Uh, yeah. We don't necessarily, uh, we don't require that as part of the process. Um, it just it just depends on um, the candidate situation. Um, there's just a few factors that maybe drives up. Got it. So where you are in the process with everything today, what, you know, what do you love all these, all this time later? What do you, what are you loving about this? And what are the plans for 1-800-PLUMBER-AND-AIR just take over the world at this point? Uh, well, like, I mean, I methodically yeah, take over the world, right? That's everybody. Yeah. You know, that's the plan. Uh, you know, I, I think what, what's most exciting is, is winning with others. And I'm not trying to sound cliche there, but like we have our own internal slot communication and, and we're always posting wins and the wins is all about our franchise owners wins, you know? And so, you know, we had a, a, a the first thing this morning, uh, one of our, one of our locations sold a really large job and, and it went out on the wind channel and we're high-fiving internally. And, and so that's really a lot of fun for us uh, is when our franchise owners are winning. Um, and so, uh, so that, that's, that that's the parts that we like. Uh, and so how do we keep replicating that? Um, so scaling, but I think strategic scaling, uh, making sure that we're doing this well. Yeah. Um, um, so, uh, no, I, I love that. I, growth is a part of it, but, I, but not, not at the rate of, uh, a losing quality, uh, yeah. in the process. Quality in that, in that customer service. So we talked a lot about scaling. So with this business, you can get to, your new disclosure document and your new item 19 is, is, is coming out the average truck or what, what, what do you disclose as to a maximum truck and, and, you know, what can you do in revenue? Cause there is sort of those averages that are realistic. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, um, and what you can see in the FTD, I think, is 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 that you know average revenue per truck uh, that's that's in our FTDs. We look at this on monthly averages, um, thirty a little over thirty five thousand uh, dollars monthly average uh, when you're looking at this. But um, you know we have a five hundred k club, which is fun, uh, and we're looking at guys that are doing over. So at our conference recently, we were we were acknowledging uh, folks that uh, t individual technicians who who were in the 500 K clubs, so that'd be one, one guy over the course of a year that did, that did more than 500,000. Yeah. Um, so those are fun guys to recognize and, and, uh, and, and the owners and uh, uh, as part of that. So, you know, the path to scaling um, uh, it's, it's similar to, it's similar. It's kind of the, 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 I, the, the assumption always is, well, more, more trucks equals more revenue. And that's not a bad assumption. It's kind of like, well, more units means a bigger franchise system. Well, yeah. maybe, but could we also not just get more revenue per truck or more yes. revenue per location, right? So so part of this is while we do want more trucks on the road, and that is part of our path for each franchise owner to scale, we also spend a lot of time going, well, if we, wherever they're at in the process, can we help them scale up a little bit more? Because it it just drives bigger margin at the end of the day per per yes. truck if if we can so it's working on training it's working on and how can we support them uh, to increase that uh, so we track that revenue per truck basis uh, not just annually we're tracking it on a month month by month basis as some of our internal barometers of how well we're doing supporting our Z's and and always wanting to push that number up because we know that that drives right back down to our franchise owner's bottom line. And so that's a, that's a critical number that, that we're, we're monitoring for ourselves internally. I love it. And as far as margins, everybody asks, and most brands are not disclosing margins. I don't know if you do, but I tell people all the time in the service industry, it's not that difficult to figure out through validation what the margins are, because number one, as far as the price points in a service business, it's not like when I was in the restaurant business and you have this huge variable known as cost of goods. I mean, if you're ripping out a toilet and putting in a new one, you have some sort of price to that, right? Unless you have to redo all the pipes. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, our, our cost of goods uh, is relatively consistent. Uh, and so, you know, uh, we look at that obviously from a percentage basis, 
um, our, our technician labor um, uh, is a big part of that. Material is a big part of that. It's going to fluctuate as with the revenue. I mean, it should yeah. when revenue's up, that should go up. When revenue's down, you know, but the percentage needs to stay the same, um, ideally month to month. So yeah, uh, we don't disclose down to net net profit, but it's um, but in this validation conversations, that's obviously an easy yeah. easy place to and, drive that. And um, volume cures everything. We know that. Yeah, well, yeah, right. We say that revenue covers a multitude of sins is what we say. Yeah, your, right. Your guy working on truck number 10, 11, 12. I mean, that's, you know, he's he's going to have a really good time with, with revenues and driving his profitability, of course. Yeah, because what's the difference in some of these other, you know, uh, this isn't necessarily unique to our model, but it's obviously unique to to this type of space this this in this space is when we're scaling we're just adding another truck right we're not having to go build out another retail or another restaurant or another you know another there's not a mil millions of dollars of investment to do that right exactly. it's, it's tens of thousands of dollars to get another truck on the road yeah. um so that path gets a lot a lot easier um as far as just getting getting more and then oftentimes it doesn't require more overhead doesn't recall oh, there is points right. of scale where you have to do it but 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 you can run uh four trucks with the same office staff that you can run two so obviously your margins get better at four than they do at two um and and the, the metrics kind of play out from there but um so that's also where it gets fun is it doesn't not every single piece when you one one additional truck on the road doesn't require everything to expand uh right. and drive up a ton of costs well, Mark, you have been fabulous. So final thoughts or tips or words of wisdom for the audience. I mean, look, you're in one of the most popular niches. People ask me about air conditioning and plumbing all the time. And I should ask you one final question before you give that final tip or thought. How do you solve plumber's crack? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a fair question, right? Uh, so properly fitting uniforms help, uh, you know, guys that are uh, self conscious about it. Uh, we actually have training on making sure that when you're talking to homeowners, please please don't do it while you're bent over, but make eye contact, smile. Uh, you know, that's that's an important important part of the process. Good, um, good. Well, I don't want to throw you off on your final thoughts, so. Yeah, um, you know, I think in uh, you know entrepreneurship, business ownership uh, is a journey. Uh, it can be one of the most rewarding things, but at the same time, it can be most one of the most uh, challenging things. You know, I, I, maybe this isn't a tip, but I, I would just say, you know, some of the things that gets me most excited is just being able to impact other people. Um, so that starts with my employees. Uh, obviously down to franchise owners, um, but but really being able to give them an opportunity. What I like about our trade, uh, the trades is really helping people build a career. You know, um, oftentimes we're working with with folks that, that didn't, college wasn't for them, um, and but we're able to give them a skill that will serve them well for the rest of their life. And you know, a lot of our, a lot of plumbers are out there making over, you know, making six figures uh, year over year uh, and be able to provide well for their families. And so being able to help scale and grow that across the country um, is another uh, exciting passion of mine. Um, you know, while college is great and I'm about to send my daughter off there, but it's not the only path. And there's some, some really solid ways for people to, to, to make a life for themselves uh, in the yeah. trades. Well, Mark, you've been awesome. Thanks for being here and uh, hope to meet you in person soon enough. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, appreciate it. My pleasure. If you're ready to talk about franchise opportunities, hit the link below to schedule a call. My services are free. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for listening.